Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ryan Berg. I'm the director of the Americas program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies based in Washington, DC. It's my great pleasure and my great good fortune this afternoon to be able to moderate the discussion called Fireflies, Rethinking the North American Energy Economy. Before we formally launch into our discussion, I'd just like to talk a little bit about our logistics for this afternoon. Our conversation up here will last about 60 minutes. Our discussion obviously will take place in English without translation. Uh, following the moderated portion of our discussion, we'll field questions from the audience. Um, you all have been here this morning, so you know how to submit, hopefully, uh, questions through the, the Whova app, which is the conferences app. Natural gas is one of the predominant fuel sources throughout the North American bloc. The panel will begin by providing a holistic view of the North American energy ecosystem with an emphasis on the role of natural gas and energy security and energy transition to renewable energy sources. The panel will break down the intersection of energy security, natural gas, and nearshoring, and outline areas from Mexico, the United States, and Canada as a bloc to cooperate on bolstering their respective domestic energy sectors and increase access to energy in historically underserved regions in all three of the countries. In order to begin today's discussion, let me introduce to you today's outstanding panel. Our first panelist is Warren Levy. He's the CEO of Jaguar Exploración y Producción, a Mexican private company with the mission of strengthening the national energy industry and community development. Mr. Levy has experience with energy companies in over 20 co energy companies in over 20 countries on four continents and has contributed strategically to the economic growth and development of the industry in Latin America. Our second panelist is Antonio Massu of Council at Agon. Mr. Massu is an attorney specialized in the development of energy projects as well as in regulation and market competition issues. He has more than 12 years of professional experience as a law practitioner focusing on energy law, among many other things. Our third panelist is Leonardo Robles, Vice President of Commercial and Business Development at TC Energy. Mr. Robles brings more than 25 years of experience in the energy sector, which includes more than 15 years at TC Energia. Our fourth panelist is Sergio Romero, Regional Vice President of Regulatory and Public Affairs at Sempra Infrastructure. He has over eight years of experience in the energy sector with an emphasis on industry and regulation. And our fifth panelist is Katia Sonjano, Director of Planning and Sustainability at Iberdrola Mexico. Katia is the former Energy Director at Diocero, one of the most important steel companies in Mexico. And in 2019, she was named one of the 100 most powerful women by Forbes magazine. In the energy sector, she's held the Office of General Director, CFE Calificados, a subsidiary company of the Federal Electricity Commission, or CFE. So welcome to our panel. I think it's clear that we've, we've established here a superlative panel of individuals to talk about this issue. I gave you all their very brief bios so that we could get into the discussion, but suffice it to say that they've all done uh, much more uh, if you care to, to dig into their backgrounds. Warren, let's start with you uh, in kicking off this, this discussion. As I mentioned in, in the introduction, You've worked on developing energy projects in over 20 countries on four continents. What makes North America as a bloc unique in terms of its energy ecosystem? Um, how do North America's traditional energy industries, such as oil and gas, interact to contribute to regional energy security? Thanks, Ryan. I think, you know, what makes North America unique is the level of integration that exists between three very large producers and three very large owners of significant reserves. We, for whatever reason, have forgotten over the last couple of years that collectively Canada, the U.S. and Mexico represents a reserve base and a production base similar to OPEC. But due to lap, lack of cooperation, really, there has been no influence as a you know, regional power base to offset any other political interests that may exist in the sector. We're also somewhat unique in the level of integration that exists between the three markets. Um, while the European electricity market is quite highly integrated and some parts of the oil and gas sector are integrated, it's really a level of integration that is not seen anywhere else in the world. But for whatever reason, political, cultural or otherwise, we've stopped cooperating. And, and as a result, we're not really taking advantage of the unique position and we're not looking at the development of the resources that exist in Canada, the US and Mexico on a strategic level about producing where the energy is needed, ensuring the infrastructure is present to distribute it in an equitable fashion and, and avoid some of the pitfalls like you know, recently has happened in the U.S. canceling a pipeline for oil that's going to move on 
on trains and trucks anyway, uh, and forgetting about the fact that getting energy to more remote areas, not just of southern Mexico, but even parts of the U.S. and Canada that are energy starved, is key to long-term development initiatives and making sure the region is stable. Thanks very much, Warren. Uh, Katya, as part of planning, I imagine you are heavily involved in identifying risks in energy projects in, in the region. In your experience, uh, what vulnerabilities exist in the North American energy infrastructure, and how do they impact energy access and security? Well, first of all, I would like to say that uh, our region is deeply connected, not only because energy um, reasons, but our industries are connected. We have different uh, approaches to the um, com to commercial um, to the commercial global scenario, and from that point, uh, for the last. Uh, 30 years, we have been to working together uh, as a sole region uh, from NAFTA to to this point. We we proved that uh, we have a lot of um, similarities, but also we have um, issues where we are complementary and that has been uh, working very well. So having said that, I would like to mention that um, that also poses a risk because uh, as we uh, as we could see it in February 21, where we all remember this uh, polar vortex that uh, hit uh, Texas, uh, given that the um, our systems are deeply integrated in terms of natural gas, as you may know. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, nowadays um, Mexico produces. 50, around 50% 50 of the electricity we consume in Mexico as a whole coming from gas. And from that number, 70% of that gas comes from Texas and other parts of the US. So what happened um, shows that uh, we need to build um, resilient, comprehensive, uh, secure systems to keep the lights on in the region. There's not only a matter of um, working in each uh, geography, but we need to see it as a whole. Uh, I would like also to point out that there is a need to build uh, more ties, international ties in the border, to take advantage of different uh, natural resources, but also different prices and different technologies that are used in one, day in one side and the other. I think there's a matter of redundancy that has to be put it in, in the center of the discussion, because now, uh, and I will add also, um, not, to, not to go any further on that, but storage, uh, natural gas storage, uh, of course, batteries, and there is, we need to work in that, in that sense in order to have a more resilient, secure, uh, and uh, integrated system that help us as a region. Thanks very much, Katia. Leonardo, one thing we often hear from governments is the need to transition to renewable sources of energy as soon as possible. But in many countries, including the three in North America, this is a long way off, and we will need to rely on fuels like natural gas for many years to come. So how can North America effectively balance its well-established oil and gas sectors with the growing renewable space? Thanks, Ryan. And, um, and, I, and I think that uh, precisely um, when we think about the goals that we have and, and understand that you know, the, the need for um, climate action is how do we balance that with other priorities that we also have you know, along with the health of the planet uh, and addressing all of the social elements and you know, all of the things that, that we've discussed in this panel and, you know, that I also heard other panelists uh, talking about yesterday about the North American competitiveness and then uh, closing the gap with some of the uh, fundamental issues that we still have in, in some of jurisdictions. So, um, particularly with, um, you know, addressing things like uh, poverty uh, in, in several um, portions of Mexico, that um, it, it brings us to um, thinking about, so how do we bring energy security that continues to maintain our North American competitiveness um, that is uh, affordable, uh, that is uh, reliable, and that it addresses um, and takes climate action. So um, natural gas uh, becomes a fundamental element uh, to achieve this goal. Um, and 
also some of the things that I heard uh, in with several of, of our panelists uh, with respect to uh, our, our treaties and what brought North America together is uh, finding those points of interest and uh, what are what are the goals that we should all you know work together to achieve and uh, the partnership that we um, managed to achieve with uh, Comisión Federal de Electricidad was precisely in one of those things that we were aligned, and that is the uh, displacement of highly uh, carbon intensive uh, fuels for power generation with natural gas by you know, reducing uh, CO2 and other uh, pollutants and as uh, Katia was mentioning, more than 50% uh, is on electricity generation. So um, the, the projects that we've been developing uh, jointly with Comisión Federal de Electricidad have been precisely to displace uh, coal, fuel oil, and diesel that has helped CFE achieve a massive breakthrough on uh, carbon emissions and, and other pollutants. So, so with that, uh, the other element has also been, how do we uh, take advantage of this infrastructure that's been put in place so that we also um, address another significant issue in our country, which is, you know, the social disparity. And this is by leveraging um, the natural gas supply that we have in the regions that, that we've established so that it also provides elements for industry development. This was the example of the joint projects that we did in Central Mexico, particularly in the Bajio Corredor, that you know, having the system in place for natural gas, uh, sorry, for, for um, power generation, also enabled other industries such as auto industry that uh, changed the landscape of those regions. And, and also with a big strong focus today on replicating that model for the Mexican Southeast. Thanks, Leonardo. Uh, Sergio, uh, to you, uh, in your experience, what strategies can the region adopt to ensure a smooth and sustainable energy transition considering economic, environmental, and social factors? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for the invitation to this, to this panel. I mean, clearly, the energy industry has the enormous challenge of uh, powering our economy and helping uh, build a more prosperous region while fighting climate change. Uh, this implies that we have to supply a vast amount of energy and at the same time decarbonize our economies. Uh, so there seems to be a growing tension between energy security and energy uh, transition. On the top of uh, the pressing need to uh, accelerate the transition to clean energies, recent events like the war, the war in Ukraine uh, have uh, stressed the importance of having uh, uninterrupted access to energy sources. Well, today the, the, consen the, the consensus uh, seems to be to follow what is being called an all of the above approach, which means taking advantage of all the energy sources we have in our region while deploying uh, new technologies. And I will uh, dive a little uh, bit deeper uh, in this. Uh, for example, renewables. Renewables are, of course, the, the most obvious path uh, towards a more uh, sustainable energy industry. However, they have two problems. The first is that they are intermittent. Uh, you know, sun not always shine, the wind not always blow. Uh, hydro cannot run during uh, dry years. Uh, and the second problem is that um, they are, or they could be unequally distributed across the region. Well, the first problem uh, can be solved by a combination of batteries, electricity storage, uh, and a mix of different sorts of renewables, uh, uh, placing wind plus solar plus hydro. And uh, 
the second problem uh, the one has to do with with the distribution of uh, of renewable uh, potential across the region can be solved by investing in transmission lines that can enable us to move uh, the clean generation from one place to another. For example, Sempra, the company I represent, uh, currently operates a wind farm in Baja California that is exporting a, a clean energy to the US. Uh, on the other hand, we have natural gas, right? Uh, I mean, natural gas is reliable, it is cheap, and it is uh, very abundant in, in North America. Uh, of course, it is fossil, uh, uh, but it is cleaner than other options like diesel or, or fuel oil no? that, that they are used for, uh, for generating electricity. Uh, but, uh, and that's why natural gas is considered a transition fuel, you know? uh, because it can help us to decarbonize our matrix, especially in the short and medium term. Uh, and moreover, there are new industries or new technologies that can help us generate cleaner molecules. Uh, uh, the most common examples are biogas, no? Uh, that can be mixed with natural gas to reduce the, the carbon footprint, or a carbon sequestration that can be deployed along uh, oil and gas projects in order to directly capture uh, CO2 emissions from, from the air. So uh, my take on, on the transition is that uh, we don't have to choose between energy security and energy uh, transition. No? In the North American region, we can have them both. Uh, by using all the energy sources we have available and deploying uh, new technologies to, uh, to overcome the limitations of each energy source. Thanks very much, Sergio. Uh, the issue of disparities and differences in, in access to energy has come up in multiple responses from our panelists. I promise I'll get to that issue uh, a little bit later in, in some very direct questions. But uh, Antonio, uh, from a regulatory perspective, what policies or initiatives are necessary to maximize the potential of both natural gas um, and you know, perhaps maybe uh, uh, the transition towards cleaner and more sustainable uh, energy sources? Yes. So uh, I think that before uh, addressing specific initiatives or policies about natural gas, we should realize or have a full appreciation of what's the status, what's the natural gas landscape in, in, in North America. And it's something that Sergio mentioned. And, and, and the good news is that it's very good. Um, North America, I think that it's very privileged in terms of natural gas. It has abundant resources of natural gas. It has a lot of natural gas. It has cheap natural gas. It trades in very, very liquid markets. And it has very good, robust, abundant infrastructure, at least in the um, United States, in Canada, some of it in Mexico. So that compared to other regions of the world, I mean, we don't see that in other regions. We see Europe, which is constantly stressed by geopolitical issues. Uh, they suffer fluctuations of prices all the time. Same happens in Asia. So. First thing we have to be aware of is how um, privileged is uh, North America's position in terms of natural gas. Once we know that the position of North America in terms of, of, of the availability of, of these, re of these uh, resources is, is very good, we can start designing policies or uh, regulation in order to maximize the value of natural gas in the light of the energy transition, of course. So basically, this, what this means is, you know, uh, making natural gas uh, less harmful uh, in the light of the transition. Uh, and there are some strategies, very concrete strategies that we may follow. Uh, first, I would say carbon capture strategies are working. Uh, from what I've, you know, from the conversations I've had in the last months with, with, uh, with many companies, I've seen that there's a great interest for this a great appetite for carbon storage. There are many major oil and gas companies that are um, starting or developing very aggressive business units in this, in this regard. So I think that that strategy would, of course, work 
in the light of uh, maximizing the value of natural gas uh, towards the energy transition. Something else that might work is um, drafting and issuing more stringent regulations in terms of emissions. Uh, the EPA in the United States is doing that. Uh, CNH and ASEA in Mexico are, are, are taking care of that as well. Of course, they have to go deeper into that issue, but we have regulators that are taking care of that. And, you know, there are some more creative, uh, innovative strategies like, you know, paying a premium to natural gas generators when they uh, provide backup services for, 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 uh, for variable energy resources uh, and the like. So I think that there are many strategies that we can follow, the various strategies that are ongoing in many parts of the world. Hmm. But first, we have to realize how, how, and I would say this word, how lucky uh, North America is in terms of the, of, of the natural gas industry. Thanks very much, Antonio. Uh, in the next round of, of questions, uh, I'm actually going to pose one question and ask for uh, all of the panelists to, to opine. Please feel free to note areas where you both agree and also where you disagree uh, with, with your fellow panelists. We oftentimes find uh, panelists sort of playing off one another and, and tending to agree. Please feel free to highlight areas where maybe there's some, some disagreement among you. I think we might find some fruitful areas for conversation. And so I think the, the most obvious thing to ask at, at this point is to talk about uh, energy issues and the intersection of energy issues with a number of, of important topics in the bilateral relationship or in the trilateral relationship. So the first question, and we'll start with you, Warren, and we'll go down the panel. What is the role of energy in North American prosperity, particularly as it pertains to friendshoring and nearshoring? How does it impact various aspects of economies and societies? Well, if you actually look at the numbers and you look at the, in, the energy intensity of Chinese industry and think about even 1% of that industry relocating back closer to the US, and let's say for sake of argument, all of that comes to Mexico. And if you assume that most of the energy comes from natural gas, we're not talking about importing six or seven BCF a day. We're talking about importing 12 or 15 BCF a day overnight. So the opportunity is there. The demand is there. The question really is, is the energy going to be there? And if the energy is there, and I re it refer to all types of energy, it's not just natural gas, it's electricity, it's, it's diesel, it's everything that you're going to need. If it's going to be there, where is it available? It's available along the border. It's available in Canada. It's available in parts of the U.S. that are becoming attractive, like Texas in particular, that's becoming somewhat attractive for relocating manufacturing capacity. It's not available in southern Mexico. And it's not available where there are large sources of population that are underprivileged today because of the energy divide, because of the fact that energy in Monterey costs a third of what it costs on the Guatemala border. And if we don't do something to fix that, what's going to happen is we're going to exacerbate the, the energy divide, which is causing illegal immigration. Illegal immigration isn't happening because people want to move out of Oaxaca and go live along the U.S. border or want to go across the border to the U.S. They have to because there's no opportunity available for dignified jobs in a lot of areas of Mexico and even worse in the northern parts of Central America. The opportunity is there, but we're not seeing anywhere near the pace of investment and new manufacturing capacity in Mexico that I think anybody's expecting. And the reason for it is first and foremost, the lack of energy. And the second is lack of clarity around policy that give the people the confidence to make generational type investments and, you know, factories that are going to need to be productive for 30 or 40 years. Believing that we're going to get all the gas we need from the U.S. is, a, I believe, a fallacy when you actually look at the numbers. And if you believe this isn't about de decarbonizing the industry alone, this is about avoiding carbon and biomass being the two primary sources of the incremental electricity that's required in the region. The U.S., the argument's not between diesel and gas or between being a little bit better. It's about, do you reactivate carbon plants or do you continue down the road of believing you can get away from it? And in Mexico, it's really about displacing biomass in a lot of places. So if we don't have a strategy in place that allows the energy to flow to where it needs to flow, we're gonna just exacerbate a problem that is now, thanks to the brilliant governor of Texas who's busing immigrants to the Canadian border, now an issue for all three countries. And I think we need to think about this, not in terms of just how do we ensure growth, but what's the game changing situation if you can take someone whose energy cost is 30 or $40 a million BTU and deliver them an energy source that the cost is four or $5 a million BTU? What does that do to society? 
What does that do to opportunity? And what does it do? You know, I think we're missing the boat here. This isn't about Mexico installing in manufacturing capacity just to support the U.S. Mexico is the logical destination for manufacturing capacity to replace all of the demands in Latin America because nobody wants to make investments in almost all of the economies in Latin America as well right now because of political instability. There could be manufacturing in North serving the U.S. and manufacturing in the South, in places like the Yucatan, supplying all of Central America and South America. If we had an energy policy and a, situa- and, a, and a system and a regional view that allowed us to accelerate the projects of getting the energy where it's needed. And it should also be noted that um, in Mexico, I think there's the most sophisticated industrial base of any Latin American country as um, indicated in a number of different indices. Just to clarify on the number that you threw out at the, at the very beginning of, of your uh, contribution is 1% of Chinese industrial. Uh, if you assume that the energy that for that manufacturing capacity comes from gas, you would double the demand for natural gas in, in Mexico overnight. Katya, what is the role of energy in North American prosperity, particularly as it pertains to French shoring and near shoring? Well, I think it's crucial. Warren just uh, pointed out some of the main um, relevant aspects of having how uh, attracting new investments is deeply connected to the fact that we have not only available of energy, but also we, we need to have a competitive in terms of price. And also I would like to point out that the clean energy is now the key. I will disagree, I agree, but disagree with my colleagues in terms of how uh, the role of natural gas is still uh, key. And I, I, of course, agree with the fact that even after the war between Russia and Ukraine, that was even clearer than ever. Um, that led us actually to the fact that in Europe, you may know that uh, all the energy, all the, all the electricity that is produced with uh, natural gas was renamed and now it's sustainable energy. That means that um, uh, we still, as a society, and, and Europe, because they do not, as you mentioned, Andres, I think, Antonio, yes. and Andres, I, Antonio. Um, Europe is relying in, 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 this, uh, in this fuel coming from other countries with all these geopolitical tensions. However, in terms of looking at our region, and in terms of uh, new shoring and French shoring and all these uh, new phenomena, I think we should really take into account that renewals are key to attract this investment, to capture this investment. Uh, Warren has given very interesting numbers. And uh, I would say that Mexico has the uh, urgent challenge to develop uh, the infrastructure needed in terms of um, capturing this investment. Nowadays, I would say that and I'm sure if we go to the other panels that are taking place today or we go to the uh, dinners today that are hosting uh, the, the governors, we will, we will listen to the same story. We are ready to capture all these investments coming from near shoring or French shoring. However, we need infrastructure and we need electricity urgently. I'm sure and I can tell you that um, I would say that there are two kinds of states in Mexico, those who already have access to energy and um, have um, industry in their, within their, in their, in the cities or whatever, like the northern uh, states in the country, but they need more energy in order to, to, to be ready to receive this new investment. And those other states that are been, that have been not included in all this energy uh, uh, boost that uh, really, uh, we faced in the in the previous years, and they do not even have access to natural gas like the all the southern region of Mexico. They have access to the gas that Pemex produces, but that gas is not going to the industry and not even going to the uh, power uh, generation. So, as a conclusion, as a general conclusion, we need really to work on not only in transmission because everybody now talks about the need to develop a uh, more extended grid and more reliable grid, but also we need to work on generation. And uh, natural gas, of course, as this base loaded um, uh, power we need for the country, yes, of course, we need that uh, natural gas still, but we need to think about the future and start building uh, a, this, uh, a, a new platform where all renewables are welcome. It's wind, it's solar, but what about geothermal, for example? Geothermal is a very um, it's, it's, it's a very complete uh, source of energy since it's space loaded, but it's renewable and has a lot of uh, 
challenge, of course, in terms of capex and um, in terms of risk. But why don't have a look on that? Thanks very much, Katia. Same question to you, Antonio. What is the role of energy in North American prosperity, and particularly as it pertains to the, the conversation that we all love to have about friendshoring and nearshoring opportunities? Yes. Uh, well, I, I think it's it's a key element of of all this process, not just for nearshoring, which is you know a very very important phenomenon that we're seeing, but also for the other big economic phenomenon that we're seeing in the region, which is the use mechanic, right? which are kind of the two sides of the same token in many regards. Um, and and I, I will just go back to maybe the mid 80s and early 90s, where this um, uh, manufacturing model in Mexico started, when many companies started to move some factories from their original places to mostly the border in Mexico, to the border states and some of the regions. Uh, back then, I would say that the main concern for those companies was security, right? How to move these people safely, how to keep them safely in Mexico. And many years, many, 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 many years after, or 35, 40 years after, that has changed. I think that security, of course, is still an issue, but I wouldn't say it's the biggest issue. I would say that right now, the biggest issue for these companies is energy access to a uh, reliable, uh, affordable, secure uh, supply of energy. If you don't have that, you will not be able to come here and deploy a factory in Mexico, and you will not be able to meet the trade requirements uh, under the USMECA. So energy is paramount because in the absence of energy, of, the, of, of, of um, you know, a, a, a supply of energy with the characteristics I just mentioned, this 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 uh, big economic phenomena will just not happen. So I think that having having uh, the right infrastructure, the right supply of energy, the right amount of local energy requirements, it's it's paramount because otherwise uh, these things will just not happen. Thanks very much, Antonio. Over to you, Leonardo. Feel free to disagree or agree <laughs> with your fellow panelists and any of the points that they've made. Thanks, Ryan. Um, and, and, you know, I actually uh, read a, a very interesting article, probably you all have, uh, Guillermo Garcia Alcocer published the uh, relation of, of energy and nearshoring. So I will save you from re-quoting everything he said <laughs> and invite you all to read the article. But I would uh, like to take this opportunity. You, you just reminded me, Ryan, um, I, I've already shared um, among friends our um, successful uh, partnership with the CFE in achieving their goals. So I'd like to share a little bit more of just before we got to that partnership and, and the discussions we were having and uh, the engagement we had, we had with you know, certain government official that uh, provided me some candid feedback about um, what, what this uh, negotiation of the contract meant and investor confidence and, and all of these things that uh, were concerning to us. Uh, so the feedback was, well, um, you know, you folks in energy think that you are the center of the universe. <laughs> so did, did you know that energy in Mexico represents 7% of the GDP? So I didn't know that. Um, but, but, but what, what that got me reflected is that, you know, in itself, energy is not, of course, you know, the largest component of the economy, but similar to a car, you know, fuel is a small component that without the fuel, then you don't run the entire car. So to your question about, you know, what is the role of energy uh, in North American development? I would say, yeah, with, without the energy, then we can't achieve any of our goals. Um, and then how do we leverage uh, energy? And I did hear one of the panelists uh, last night talk about that in his view, um, for the first time in 30 years, North America has all of the conditions present for energy security. And, and it, you know, he touched on um, several of, of the points that Warren just, just mentioned and, and how uh, not only, you know, having all of this connectivity to the most abundant 
uh, you know, low cost <clears throat> supply of natural gas in, in South and, and uh, West Texas, but also reserves that, that we have uh, in, in Mexico and the connectivity of, of energy also that has happened for decades between Canada and the United States. How do we leverage that and how do we provide all of the conditions <clears throat> for that energy security, not only to be maintained, um, sorry, not only to be there, but to be maintained o over the years. So I I'd like to share, um, you know, some uh, an anecdote of, um, you, you said I had been with, with TC Energy more than 50 years. Actually, it was in 1995 when I was in a uh, division called Nova International that we uh, develop a pipeline that uh, was going from Argentina to Chile. Uh, this was, you know, um, in the 90s. And um, you probably know, you know, what happened is that, um, you know, Bolivia had some issues with Chile that, um, you know, then went over to Argentina, then Argentina uh, suspended service of the pipeline we had just built uh, to move natural gas from Argentina uh, into Chile, right? So for about 20 years, uh, this pipeline was operating at lower than 8% of its capacity. And then, you know, that same thing happened with the other pipeline we've built further south. So, um, you know, this, this was, you know, to me, a, a, a very, very uh, important eye-opener in my career with respect to, you know, the reason why uh, TC Energy back then, you know, in, in the 90s when we had assets in Europe and South America and, and everywhere else decided to divest and focus only in North America is because we saw that the better conditions to build infrastructure and, 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 and connectivity is amongst friends that, you know, we have common goals and we have the treaties to support that. Thanks, Leo. Uh, Sergio, I know it's a difficult position to go last. Um, we've, we've heard lots of, lots of different things, including uh, that unresolved issues from the Guerra del Pacifico in 1873, if my memory is, uh, is not mistaken, still having impacts on, on energy and places where TC has worked. Uh, anything you want to add to no, the conversation? I mean, I, yes, I, I, I tend to agree with my, with my colleagues. I would only add a, uh, a couple of data points I have with me and, and a few uh, remarks. I mean, I do agree that this is a unique moment for our region. You know? uh, this is truly a once in a generation uh, opportunity since uh, NAFTA, as, and, and, as Antonio was, was saying. Uh, Mexico could attract up to 50 billion of additional investment because of nearshoring. And, and new shoring is uh, not only a possibility, uh, but it is actually showing in the in the data right now. No? Uh, in, in 2022, the Ministry of Economy reported a 12 increase in foreign direct investment compared to 2021. But in the first quarter of 2023, foreign direct investment jumped by 48%. So this is this is actually happening. No, we we all heard stories. Uh, of uh, industrial parks in Nuevo León, in Querétaro, in the Bajío region that are uh, filling up pretty quickly. No? So I, I do agree, no? uh, we have the opportunity there, but we have to do our homework. No? And energy is uh, one of the key components to unlock the, the new shoring potential. As it, has, as it has been said repeatedly, we have to be able to provide clean, affordable, and reliable energy for the relocating companies. Um, and to do that, as, um, as Katia was, was saying, we have to heavily invest in energy infrastructure in the following years. We have to build pipelines, we have to uh, do natural gas storage, transmission, distribution lines, of course, <clears throat> renewable generation, uh, uh, you, you, you name it. No? And, 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 and my last, my last um, remark is that new shoring is also an opportunity to continue to strengthen the integration uh, between, between uh, US, Mexico, and Canada in the, in the, in the energy sphere, no? I mean, we, we actually have a, a pretty, a pretty uh, um, 
or, or one of the most interconnected natural gas grids in the world. No? Uh, I, I, we have around 24 interconnection points, no? Uh, as it was said by, by, by Katia, Mexico imports from the US around 70% of the natural gas it consumes, no? And we are even building LNG terminals to source the gas in the US, bring it to Mexico, and export it to Asia and, 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 and Europe. Uh, and in the power sector, and this is uh, less known that, that, that natural gas uh, uh, story, in the, in the power sector, uh, we have 10 cross-border transmission lines. No? And we are even right now exporting clean energy from Mexico to the US. No? Uh, uh, the, 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 the example is uh, uh, Energia Sierra Juarez, no? a, a wind farm, Sempra has in Baja California. It's exporting uh, uh, electricity to California to help them achieve their climate goals. Uh, so, I mean, truly nearshoring uh, represents a unique opportunity, but as I just said, we have to do the homework. No? Providing clean, reliable, and affordable energy is one of the most important conditions. Thank you very much, Sergio. We've got a little over 20 minutes left. I'm gonna ask one more question that I want all of our panelists to opine on, and then we're gonna open up the, uh, the room to, to questions. I've seen a couple questions come in already on the, uh, the, the app. Uh, keep them coming. If we've managed to provoke uh, a question uh, in your mind, we'll get to them uh, at the end. But first, uh, and I'll start in the interest of fairness, I'll start with Sergio this time. And Warren, you'll have the unenviable position of having to go last uh, the, this time. And the question is the one I promised earlier about uh, energy disparity, disparity in access uh, specifically. And so an issue of concern when developing the energy sector needed to meet the demands of the nearshoring challenge we just discussed is the equal access to energy. In other words, increasing access to energy in historically underserved regions in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. We often talk a lot about Mexico, but I think it's fair to say that there are areas of the US and Canada that would fall into the same uh, type of situation. So how can governments, industries, and communities collaborate to strengthen energy resilience and address some of these inequalities in energy access? So I wanna be very solutions focused uh, in this round of, of answers. And Sergio, we'll start with you. Having a, a social license uh, in the energy industry is key no? uh, uh, to, to, to be able to execute projects. Without social, social license, you simply cannot, cannot do uh, energy projects in Mexico or, or elsewhere. Uh, our experience has shown us that we have to work alongside the communities during all of the phases of the project. Uh, uh, in order to, to, to get them involved from the beginning, in order to share the benefits of the projects with the community and have their support. No? Um, and, and let me provide a, a, a couple of, of examples uh, uh, from, from Sempra's experience. As I just mentioned, our wind farm, Energia Sierra Juarez, which is exporting clean power to the US, uh, Energia Sierra Juarez not only has a social investment plan uh, to improve the economic well-being of the region, uh, but it also shares a percentage of the income of the wind farm with the landowners in which the wind farm was built. No? And this will provide a steady income uh, for those landowners over the next two decades. No? Uh, <coughs> The second example would be what we're doing with Sempra Infrastructure Foundation. Uh, we have this program in which uh, uh, we install uh, solar, planet, solar panels uh, in underserving uh, communities. No? Of course, these solar panels lower the electricity bills of those communities and improves, uh, in general terms, their uh, uh, well-being. Uh, so, my take is that energy companies have to put communities at the center because this is the only way in, in, in which we can uh, uh, ensure that the projects will be uh, successful and will be uh, sustainable in the long term. Thanks very much, Sergio. 
Leonardo. Thanks, Ryan. And and I, I'd say this is this is one of the key elements to everything else we've discussed in terms of you know having uh, energy security elements and the role of stakeholders, uh, including the community, uh, that I think should be important elements also of our agreements in terms of standardizing uh, when we develop energy infrastructure, whether it is in Canada, in the US, or in Mexico. Uh, and, and, you know, Warren offered some examples of, you know, very, very large infrastructure projects that, you know, couldn't proceed because of, you know, these, these uh, opinions and differences with respect to priorities. Um, you probably all saw this uh, headline in El Heraldo, I think it was yesterday, or the day before yesterday, that um, natural gas and energy is no longer a business for bankers. <laughs> um, I hope they're wrong, and, um, but, but you know, it's, it's food for thought in terms of uh, all of what this does is make energy infrastructure um, development extremely risky, therefore extremely expensive. So um, infrastructure projects, and, and well, I, I can speak for pipelines, which is where I've spent several, several years, um, is highly, highly uh, politically exposed and socially exposed uh, projects. We go through uh, hundreds and thousands of um, communities and landowners uh, to get, you know, and any linear infrastructure uh, would, would have to go through this. So I think this, this is an area of opportunity. I remember the discussions that took place, um, you know, before the energy reform in 2013, uh, we had a Mexican delegation in our head office in Calgary uh, to discuss, um, you know, what what are the things we need to consider uh, so that we have the right levels of engagement in terms of consultation and approval, uh, so that we can develop infrastructure projects. Um, I do think that today, you know. For Mexico, for example, the process described in the hydrocarbons law for land acquisition um, definitely has a lot of area for improvement uh, in terms of, um, I, and, and I agree with Sergio in that we absolutely put our communities front and center of whatever it is we're doing in these, sorry, in these areas. It's just that these uh, gaps uh, that were left in our uh, legislation, and this is you know for all three countries, is actually not um, the object of the communities to stop the projects, but you know people following other interests that are not necessarily aligned with the communities uh, who we are going to be sharing the space with. So um, you know, al along with that, um, I would say regulatory certainty is is another. Uh, strong area of focus that as we um, take a stronger approach with respect to reinforcing the conditions to make North America and continue to have North America the most competitive region in the globe. Um, the globe is not static. The globe continues shifting. And, and this position that we have today can easily change if we're not top of our game in terms of how do we get the three countries aligned with respect to what conditions it is we have in place for community engagement, for regulatory certainty, so that infrastructure development is a, an, a place where you know, bankers and investors want to continue to allocate capital. And going back to our previous discussions, so that we continue to have the energy that North America needs to continue to prosper. Thanks, Leo. Uh, Antonio, over to you. And if we can um, speed up just a little bit the responses, I do want to get to the questions that are in the room because I see a couple filtering into the app. I'll try my best. Um, I, th I think that governments have a lot to do in terms of addressing inequality of access. I think the first thing, um, first and foremost, I would say is harmonization in policy and in regulation. We cannot 
solve an issue if we don't agree on what the goal is or what the issue is. And that is very clear in the light of what has happened last years in the United States and in Mexico. Uh, while the United States is deploying an enormous amount of money in, in developing renewable energies, um, we're building a huge refinery here. So that doesn't look like we're sharing a common goal. So the first thing we have to do is, you know, just agree on what the problem is. Um, and as, as much as I would like to blame the government for anything, uh, now that I'm not part of the government, uh, I would <laughs> like to say that also there are some things that the industry can do in terms of securing access. And I think it has to do with the something, I would say the philosophy of investment of some companies. Uh, and this has to do also with the problem of what comes first is kind of the chicken and the egg uh, problem. There, there are a lot of regions in Mexico that are highly undeveloped. Uh, many regions in south, southeast of country, like Oaxaca, Chiapas. Uh, and among many reasons, they are on the underdeveloped because they don't have access to natural gas. Uh, but are they undeveloped because they don't have access to natural gas or they don't have access to natural gas because they are undeveloped. It's a big discussion that we've been having for a lot of time, but I think that having this discussion is very, very useful uh, if we want to close the gap between the inequalities of access in Mexico. We just have to, 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 to remember that only 7% of the population in Mexico has residential access to natural gas. That is absurdly low. So I think that the government is accountable in a it, it, it's it's accountable for for the inequalities that we have in Mexico uh, in terms of taxes. But I think that companies should rethink their investment decisions in terms of how they can close this gap as well. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, Katia, mm -hmm. about what, about one minute, and then Warren, one minute. Yeah, I I, I think that the, the the first thing is to shift the conversation. Um, nowadays, energy is considered to be like a major major players uh, conversation, with only uh, big players are involved. I think now uh, we as my colleagues mentioned previously, we need communities to be involved. We need to be to have strong regulation. We have. We need to have a strong regulators that can um, work together with all the development of this infrastructure. But there's also a new approach that maybe um, can help to have everybody on board, and that is uh, creating hubs where everybody is uh, somehow involved in these uh, supply chains. Renewables are bringing a huge opportunity to, to involve uh, communities that now or previously were not part of the development. Maybe they were part of these uh, social programs, of course, but they, are, they were not part of the business. To put it clear, now with this um, the, the the possibility to, for example, to uh, with landowners to be part of the project, uh, having, and I must stress that the proper legal framework to give everybody comfort and uh, to mitigate the risk that can be uh, associated to these new uh, ways of involvement. I think that is key, that is key, and uh, I also think that. Um, we, we need to uh, work together in terms of the future because everybody wants to have a better future for, for, for their kids and their generations, the future generations. So we need to really work on changing the quality of the energy that we are investing on. And that is, that, that's in that perspective, we need the local stakeholders to be uh, involved and, and also to change the view of the major energy players are only there and they are gonna take the profits and maybe take it to other place. So I think it's a matter of communication, regulation, and the proper approach to the right stakeholders. Thanks, Katia. Warren, I said it's the, the unenviable position to go last. No uh, problem, I'll be quick, Ryan. Um, I think we need to be stop being afraid. We, we've, we've lost a generation in North America that believes the rhetoric that the energy sector is somehow evil 
And because we're behaving like we're guilty, we're getting treated like we're guilty. The best possible thing that could happen to the oil industry over the long term is that no barrel of oil is burned in, in an internal combustion engine ever again. That oil is used for high value products, for petrochemicals, for plastics that are going to be needed for medical supplies. Does anybody want to go back to no plastics in the hospitals? Anybody want to go back to trusting that sterilization is the only way you're going to be sure that your the materials being used in your surgery are safe? Nobody wants to go back to that. But because we're behaving like we're somehow guilty, we're getting treated like we are. The, the energy industry has done extraordinary things and is the primary reason that the world has developed and needs to continue to be the primary engine of growth for the world. Do we need to be better about it? Yes. Two primary sources of emissions in Mexico are voluntary emissions by Pemex and inefficiency in the power grid. Those are problems we can fix. We don't need to go 100% renewable to cut 60 or 70% of the emissions in the country. We need to do a lot of boring engineering that nobody likes to talk about and is not politically sexy to be able to, to deal with. But that's where we need to go and we need to focus on education and we need to be proud about the, the fact that we work in the energy sector and go talk to kids. We've lost the centennials and the younger millennials in North America. They're not coming back to us. But Mexico has an extraordinary asset. Mexicans perceive this being a country that they're proud that produces oil and gas. They're proud of Pemex. Mexicans believe that the energy industry has been key to the development of areas in the South where Pemex did extraordinary things. In the 70s and 80s, no North American or European oil company was building schools or hospitals. Pemex was. And that's a resource that we can build on and we can recapture the imagination of youth that the energy industry is the mechanism to ensure that the world continue to grow and we can do it responsibly. And we need to stop hiding behind the fact that, oh, I'm sorry, we're, we're going to emit a little bit less and I'm really sorry. We need to capture the communities and have us want to be there. There are models that work. In Iceland, if you accept a geothermal project being built in your backyard, you get free energy. It's an extraordinary incentive to not be worried about the project being done in your backyard. You want it to be done well? You want it to be done safely, but there's an incentive and it's a direct incentive for the people that are affected by the operation. That's what we need to get to. And we need to get out in front of the communities and work with youth in Mexico to understand what the energy industry can mean to the future of Mexico. Great. Thank you, Warren. Uh, we now are going to move to a quick uh, Q&A session with about three minutes left in, in, the, in the panel. Um, our wonderful program coordinator, Ruby Bledsoe, is here to, to my left. She's got the app up and is going to ask a, a couple questions that I can direct to our panelists. Thank you, Ryan. Our first question comes from Jesus Carrillo. He asks, in Mexico, not so much in the U.S. and Canada, energy policy is fiscal policy. So if there is an energy transition, there needs to be a fiscal transition. What does Mexico need to do in order to fulfill the need for cleaner and greener industry? So I would ask Ruby, maybe you read two or three, and then I'll just direct them to the panel. We'll finish that way. Yes. One that received many votes was, does the policy of energy sovereignty put forward by the current Mexican administration mm. jeopardize the North American energy integration? Uh, I think those two are, are great uh, questions. Uh, the one on fiscal transition, uh, who, who has strong opinions on, on that? I, I, I can answer, Warren, that. I, think, answer I think the primary challenge we face in the energy industry, and it's, it's particularly the case in Mexico, is all the money that's generated goes into federal coffers, and there's no visibility for the communities that have the impact that there's any benefit for them. There have been projects around the world. Why do people in Alberta like the oil industry? Because there used to be scholarships for everybody from Alberta because of the revenue that came from the oil industry. That's gone away, sadly. But there are projects and there are examples around the world where there's visibility for the people that are affected by the operation that there's a direct benefit. And I don't think it's a question of fundamentally changing the fiscal policy. I think it's how you communicate that these benefits are being distributed back to the communities. There are countries around Latin America that do it well. There's countries that do it very badly that have caused a huge amount of civil strike. We don't need to go out and reinvent the wheel. What we need to do is make sure that the people that are not, it's not just about jobs, income for landowners, which is important. It's very important. That's a direct benefit that's tangible and is part of the reason that communities often receive us with open arms. But it's about the visibility that these revenues are actually doing something for the Mexican people and not just have it be a black hole and not have it be perceived as, well, we're just propping up Pemex or we're, we're paying debts for past governments. What's the direct benefit to the community and how we can make that visible? And that's what's going to be able to turn the perception around. Antonio, you look like you want to jump in, but I might I might ask you also to cover the question on energy sovereignty, if you if you wouldn't mind. 
Yes. Um, before jumping to that, I would just say, uh, I mean, I just remind, I just remembered something. The Mexican Constitution today it says that the profits coming from uh, the oil and gas sector will be used for the long-term development of the country. It's a constitutional mandate that is today on Mexican Constitution. I agree with Warren. Uh, maybe we just have to sharpen the mechanisms to make that wealth reach the population. But the mandate is already there. So I think that no changes must are needed on that regard. We just have to make sure that those that wealth is properly distributed. And that's not a minor challenge, of course. But I think that the most important thing is already there, which is the constitutional mandate. Uh, in terms of the sovereignty question, I mean, let's see what the just make a panel say about it. Um, I mean, if this policy, this policy has been a big issue in terms of the relationship between Mexico and the United States. Uh, there are three main issues out there, the automobile sector, the GMO sector, and now the uh, energy sector. Uh, there, those are three disputes that are, you know, alive. And I would say, uh, in principle, yes, this policy has been problematic. Let's see how problematic it gets if we go to the panels. Uh, I think it's a question to be answered. Thanks, Antonio. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. Be I know we could have gone on for, for far longer. This was a dynamic panel and a dynamic discussion. But unfortunately, we, we only had one hour to discuss this. This is a very enriching and, and enlivening uh, conversation. Thanks so much for, for coming. Warren, Katia, Antonio, Leonardo, Sergio, thanks so much for being here. Uh, thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. <laughs>